Hi, APUSH students. This is Mr. Simmons with our week three lecture. I hope everybody's doing fine. I have three more poster papers, and today's subject is World War II Part One. So, as you probably guessed, we're not going to discuss battles that much. Uh, in fact, in this lesson, we won't discuss battles at all. Most of the discussion is on the home front. Um, next class, I will go over some key battles like Pearl Harbor, Stalingrad, Midway, things like that, because last year I didn't do that, and then the students told me that there was a question or two on the EOC uh, from battles. That's not something you actually have to worry about because you don't have an EOC this year. Lucky you. And you never had a semester exam, so you don't have anything. In fact, you've probably seen the posting on EDSB where I posted the information saying you have no EOC, no semester exam, and your fourth grade, fourth quarter grade will be based on, I'm sorry, your second semester grade will be based on your third and fourth quarter grades. You already have your third quarter grade, so really this is it. If you're confused about how they calculate it, look at the semester grade calculator that I posted. Um, so for your homework, you were supposed to do, and I've already posted it, you were supposed to do World War II Part One. You see that? Okay. And I want you to do the terms as well. Okay. And then I also posted your second assignment, which is the stimulus practice. Now, I posted the questions without the rationale for the answers. I omitted them. So look closely at the ESB direction because I, I, just as a recap, I want to make sure you understand, you're not allowed just to put number one and the letter answer. You have to write a few sentences or type out, I think I said type, a few sentences justifying and explaining why you picked that answer. If you do not do that, I will deduct points. Um, so that is that for your homework. And then obviously you are reading chapter 25 in AMSCO. Okay, sounds good. So let's go ahead and start uh, the notes. So before the war, um, the impact of World War I had been pretty uh, significant. A lot of people, congressmen, senators, uh, ordinary people, World War I veterans, World War I uh, veterans like um, Eddie Rickenbacker, the, the, uh, the World War I fighter ace, or um, uh, Sergeant York, the uh, highly decorated World War I soldier, uh, along with Charles Lindbergh and uh, Gerald Nye and other people were we're really concerned that um, that World War that, that the, the the events of World War One had turned out um, badly for America. It, uh, a lot of people um, argued that this was an example of war profiteering, and we talked about that. They were called the mer the merchants of death, um, and so that because of the ill feelings from World War One. People started to turn inward, and the, the, the phenomenon of isolationism became pretty pronounced. It wasn't just among ordinary citizens. There were people in Congress who were hardcore isolationists. At this point, in the early 30s, they hadn't really quite realized what Hitler was up to or the evils of Nazism. So to them, this was just a matter of staying out of European affairs. Um, so they're very disillusioned with America's role in World War I, and they're also uh, not too happy about Japanese or German aggression. And these things combine to convince many Americans that they should stay out of world affairs. This is a common trend that we've seen going all the way back to George Washington with his farewell speech. Um, fueling the distrust was the war profiteering claims uh, that were put through in the Nye Committee, Gerald Nye, uh, which was an investigative committee in Congress that determined that World War I had been sort of a scheme to make corporations profits. 
Um, I don't think actually they're that far off in my opinion. Um, so isolationism grows pretty strongly uh, during the 1920s and early 30s. And then it, it, to the point where Congress actually adopted certain uh, congressional formal acts to make sure that Roosevelt and other people who were not isolationists um, abide by their thinking. So they came up with these things called the Neutrality Act. Um, the first one was in 1935 and prohibited all armed shipments uh, to belligerent nations. And in, at this time, this included England. So anybody who was fighting or who was about to start fighting during, uh, before 1939 was considered a belligerent nation. This included England. And it also said that U.S. citizens could not travel on the ships of belligerent nations. So no armed shipments, no U.S. citizens on ships because they're trying to avoid what? Remember the Lusitania in World War I. Uh, in 1936, they forbade loans and credits to belligerent nations. So we're not even going to give loans to England. And in 1937, they forbade shipments of arms to both sides in the Spanish Civil War, which is, in, in, you know, in retrospect, preposterous because that was a clear example of uh, Franco's fascism against, um, against ordinary, well-meaning Spanish citizens. Um, so the isolationists were concerned that Roosevelt was leaning towards pro-British policies, and they formed an actual committee called the America First Committee, and one of its most prominent members was Charles Lindbergh. Don't forget isolationism. On the AP exam, it's at home. They one or two questions, free response, LEQ, and it could be on World War II. This is something you definitely want to mention. Okay, so isolationism started to be challenged after Hitler invaded Poland in 1939. And so Roosevelt felt that British security was in America's interest. And so gradually he started moving Congress and the country towards toward an end uh, to neutrality. And so this is a little timeline. I don't know if you can see it. We'll take a screenshot later. But let's just kind of go over it briefly. In 1939, Congress institutes cash and carry, which ended the arms embargo with Britain which basically nullified the Neutrality Act of 1935. In 1940, they initiated the draft, which is called the Selective Service Act, where they registered all American men between the ages of 21 and 35. I think it was 2.1 million people were um, drafted just in the first year. Then you have the famous Lend-Lease Act. Obviously, you want to remember that. This is 1941. Britain could obtain materials and weapons on credit. Looks like they just nullified the Neutrality Act of 1936. Then Roosevelt secretly met with Churchill on a warship in the Atlantic, and they pledged support to each other. Uh, then finally in 1941, this is before December, uh, they went ahead and instituted shoot on sight which said U.S. Navy ships that were escorting British ships in the Atlantic could shoot German U-boats on site. And then finally, Pearl Harbor, December 7th, the day that we live in infamy, the United States declared war on Japan, but because Germany and Italy had a treaty with Japan, they in turn honored their treaty and declared war on America, which was obviously a foolish and stupid mistake three days later. So these are the events that led up to the invasion of Poland in 39. You want to focus on isolationism, the neutrality acts, and then unraveling of the neutrality. Okay, so you're probably wondering, why aren't we talking about Pearl Harbor, Midway, Guadalcanal, those things? Well, again, they push revised the exam in 2015. They moved away from traditional history. Uh, you can take that up with the College Board if they still exist next year. Uh, they are focusing on the home front, so that's what we're going to do. So by the war's end, 16 million men and women had served in the war. Nearly 1 million African Americans had served in segregated units. 
258,000 women had enlisted in the Women's Army Corps. Remember, they're not fighting, but they're doing pretty much everything else. Uh, the Women's Army Corps were called WACs. Of the 258,000 women who enlisted in, in the Women's Army Corps, they also included women who enlisted in you know, ambulance and uh, nursing and healthcare and hospitals. Those women were called WAVES. And then also ambulance drivers, uh, air, flying airplanes, riding on airplanes, transportation services, and those women were called WAFs. Okay? So back to war mobilization. Similar to the approach the United States took in World War I, the government organized the economic, economic production on a you know, macro giant scale. Remember, in World War I, it was called, if we were in class, I'd ask somebody, that was the War Industries Board, led by Bernard Baruch, the Wall Street financier, which again led to uh, war profiteer, profiteering claims. This is called not the War Industry Board, it's not the WIB, this is the WPB, where half of factory production was shifted towards, um, towards war materials. Going back to women, women played a huge role in wartime production. Over 5 million women joined the workforce, often moving to new communities to work in aircraft munitions and the automobile industry. There was a lot of pressure on women to do something besides stay at home. And I, I, I think that that would be a great study to just kind of look at the psychology of women who decided to stay home and continue homemaking, take care of young children and things like that, because propaganda during this time was very, very, um, uh, full, it was full of pressure. So um, there were films that characterized women working and they, you know, they characterized them and called, called these type of women Rosie the Riveter. And they were considered to be American, the Rosie the Riveter was an American heroine. Okay, so you see if you weren't, if you weren't enlisting as a whack, wave, or waff, or if you weren't Rosie the Riveter, who were you? And I think this is, this is an interesting study about women who, who chose to stay home and look after their children or, or didn't have children or whatever. I mean, was that something that psychologically uh, was, you know, detrimental on them? And, you know, I think that's an interesting question. Um, so, but anyway, just like in World War I, despite the gains that women made, women's pay was still two-thirds of, of the male worker, and at war's end, pressure, just like after World War I, was placed on them to leave the work, give the jobs back to men, and return to homemaking. Uh, internal migration is the big uh, subject in this class, obviously, you know, going all the way back to the Great Migration, um, the removal and movement of American Indians, we could go on and on. Um, this, is, this is another version of, uh, of internal migration. There are a lot of people who moved to the Sun Belt. It's called the Sun Belt Migration. Um, this would be the Southwest, California, and parts of the South, away from industrial centers in the Midwest and in the Northeast. And they moved there to work in the defense industry. A lot of women moved along with able-bodied men who weren't drafted um, for whatever reason. So internal migration, sunbelt migration is a big theme. Okay. Um, so going back to war mobilization, so like the Food and Fuel Administrations in World War I, Congress established the OPA, which is sort of the Food and Fuel Administration tied up into one. They set prices, uh, they try to control inflation, they rationed food and fuel, they handed out coupon books, no coupon, no purchase. They're very strict about it in World War II. Um, the government also became very aggressive at increasing taxes. In 1939, 4 million people filed taxes, but by 1945, 50 million people had filed taxes. So there's a giant increase in people filing taxes. There are more people are paying taxes than ever before. Remember, taxes started during World War I under President Wilson with the 16th Amendment, the income tax, the dreaded income tax. 
Debt skyrocketed during World War II. It went from 49 billion in 1941 to 259 billion in 1945. Um, so you've got a lot of debt. You have a lot of attempts to control inflation. Macro organizing, macro uh, managing the economy through the OPA, which is the World War II version of the WIB. Um, rationing food, things like that. And then don't forget the role of women as Rosie the Riveter and in the, uh, in, in the military. And then internal migration uh, to Sunbelt regions. So science, you know me, I'm not the biggest fan of science. And here's a real good example of where science has gone mad. It's called the Manhattan Project. They built the A-bomb at the Los Alamos, New Mexico site. There were various sites around the country, but this is where they assembled the bomb. The first test was called the Trinity test. It was um, exploded in, on July 16, 1945. The original reason they started the Manhattan Project is because uh, Einstein and somebody else I can't remember uh, had warned Roosevelt that Germany was working on fission, fission, uh, fission uh, and so this, this provided the impetus to start that. Um, next lecture, when we tie up World War II, we'll talk about the, the use of the bomb at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, there was discrimination during the war. Uh, the Great Migration that we learned about in World War I had intensified by World War II. Many, many more African Americans moved up north into industrial centers to work in fact. And this caused violence to break out. In one example, you had the Detroit race riots of 1943, which is a really interesting subject. Um, this would be a good ED subject. I know you've already picked your ED subjects. But who would have thought a race riot right in the middle of, of, um, of the war? There was a, a race riot right in the middle of the Civil War, remember, in 1863, the New York City race riots. Um, this guy is sort of an obscure person in history, but A. Push likes to bring him out. He's called A. Philip Randolph. He was a work, he was a part of the union that uh, managed the uh, the sleeping cars on trains back then. A lot of people traveled by trains and slept on the cars, and so he was the president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, and he was very instrumental in pushing Roosevelt to end wartime discrimination in the factories to desegregate the military. And uh, he, he threatened to march on Washington. And Roosevelt really didn't back down. He did sign an executive order, don't have the number, uh, and where they promised to investigate discrimination in industry, but he did absolutely nothing about um, desegregating the armed forces. You have to wait for President Truman who did that which was another executive order, which you don't need to know anymore. Um, if you recall, during the Great Depression, Mexican Americans were forced to return to Mexico, um, even if they'd been born in America, be, uh, because they were being displaced by poor whites from the Dust Bowl and other places. Uh, well, during the war, they were asked to return again. This was a government program called the Bracero. Because there were so many Mexican Americans Moving back into Los Angeles, that created uh, tensions between sailors who were arriving on ships on leave. And this led to the suit suit riots. And you can go look that up. It's an interesting subject. Mexican -Amer young Mexican American men were wearing uh, three piece suits with gold chains and big hats. And they look kind of like gangster style um, fashion. And the US Navy sailors didn't like that because they thought that they should be contributing to the war and fighting and blah, blah, blah. Last subject is the most important subject in a push about World War II. It always shows up as a stimulus question. Um, it's the internment of Japanese Americans in uh, camps. Uh, so over 110,000 Japanese Americans were, were put in camps um, during the war. They were forced off their land. They had a lot of prime farmland that was taken away from them. And the question is, what happened to that farmland? After the war, when they returned, 
this is an interesting subject, were they giving back their land or had it disappeared? So they were forcibly placed in camps. There were 10 locations, over seven states. Uh, the sad thing is most of the Japanese Americans who were put in these camps had actually been born in, in America. So they were actually American. Uh, so it's a really uh, sad story in our history. The Supreme Court upheld the executive order. And again, it's the Supreme Court acting badly in history. The Supreme Court, but wait a minute, the Supreme Court's always right, right? No? Dred Scott? I could go on and on. Um, Kolematsu versus the United States upheld Executive Order 9066. They said it was a military issue. Um, now, internment was advocated by labor and business groups in California, and they, the Japanese lost $105 million of farmland. Now, I say lost, or was it stolen? This would be a good EE topic. But again, you've already picked your new topics. Fascinating subjects that um, I'm sure you're writing on right now. Um, next week, we will go back and talk about battles. Uh, we'll talk about post-World War II diplomacy and significance, legacy of World War II. But I would say the main thing you want to remember for World War II is really today's lesson because the, the events leading up, isolationism and home front is usually, especially Rosie the River, in, uh, Manhattan Project, in, internment camps, these are big subjects in, in English. Okay, so that concludes the lesson for week three. I hope everybody's doing well. And I'll see you back next week. Thanks very much.